Bien, mesdames et messieurs, chers actionnaires. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, I'm delighted to welcome you for this annual general meeting and on behalf of the whole team, I would like to welcome you. Beside me, I have uh, the uh, CEO of your company, Mr. Thierry Bolloré, Madame Clotilde Delbos, Chief Financial Officer, Jean-Benoît De Vosges, Chief Legal Officer. Also on stage, we have Mr. Philippe Lagayette, Lead Director and Chair of the Audit, Risk and Ethics Committee. Mrs. Marie-Annick Darmayac, Chair of the Remuneration Committee, Mr. Patrick Thomas, Chair of the Appointments and Governance Committee, and Mrs. Olivia Q, Chair of the Strategic Committee. Representatives of KPMG and Ernst & Young, statutory auditors for the company, as well as members of the board of directors are in the front row. I would like to remind you that you are gathered for the extraordinary and extraordinary parts of the general meeting after the notice of meeting that was sent to you by mail for nominative shareholder and uh, after uh, the uh, public notices published in Ballot and Petite Zafiche for unregistered shareholders. Now we are going to appoint the Bureau. As chairman, I suggest, uh, as tell us, the two shareholders present representing for themselves and as mandants the largest number of voices or votes possible, i.e. the French government represented by Mr. Pierre Janin and the Amundi company represented by Mr. Olivier Desnos. And to serve as secretary of the general meeting, Mr. Jean-Benoît de Vosges, chief legal officer of the group, if he accepts. We now have a bureau. All legal documents were placed on the desk in line with legal provisions and made available to shareholders from the notice of meeting. These documents were recognized as compliant by the bureau. It was also confirmed to me that since the general meeting brings together over four, a quarter of uh, the shares uh, in the issued share capital with voting rights, the general meeting can validly decide on the ordinary and extraordinary resolutions on the agenda. The general meeting secretary will communicate the final results just before we move to a vote on resolutions. Let me point out that our general meeting is filmed and broadcast on the Renault Group website. I will also inform you that we have bailiffs in the room. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, this general meeting is a little special, for it is the first for me as chairman of your company, and it's also the first for me as chairman of the board of the Alliance. Today, the Alliance is taking a fresh start and it is and should remain more than ever both a pillar and a driver for the development of each of its members. Therefore, I suggest that we take stock of the Alliance's activity, and the Alliance has just turned 20 years old.
Mesdames et messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, you could see in this video great things were accomplished by the Alliance and even greater projects are in the works. Today I would like to share with you the fact that the Alliance is stronger with new governance. After the periods of turbulence that it went through, let me tell you that the Alliance has taken a fresh start, which is to be confirmed. When I arrived in the group a few months ago, I therefore discovered that the alliance against the backdrop of what is now called the Gorn case, the alliance was more damaged than it seemed. My deep-seated belief and their I fully agreed with the remit, the mission that I was given. My belief was and still remains that the priority is to restore a strong alliance, rebuilt on mutual respect and in a trust-based climate. The difficulties that were echoed in the press are in fact the reflection of a tense climate between partners where the cement that is truth well, had somewhat crumbled. Yet the good news, the good news is that nothing is irreparable. As you know, when trust is reduced, you need to reestablish the substance of this trust with gestures and commitments on both sides. Trust, as you know, is not decided but earned. That requires patience, efforts on both sides as well as time. And everybody should also make a contribution in a negotiation between major partners that already know everything that was achieved and know how beneficial this alliance was for everyone. Thus, the new alliance board that we set up on the 12th of March this year and two that I cared very strongly about now enables us to enhance the power of our collaboration and to strengthen our ways of working almost on a daily basis based on dialogue and mutual respect. And here I would like to testify about the fact that these Alliance Board meetings that I have the honor of chairing a limited board with the three CEOs of companies is now an extremely responsible board and with the few sessions that we had in Paris or Tokyo went extremely well, so much so that I felt as a chairman that the teams around the table felt that they were all in the same boat. The goals are well known, improve the growth, the profile and the performance of this alliance but the absolute priority is to go towards a vivid, agile, efficient, and stronger alliance. And in this respect, all thoughts that could lead us to an improvement are welcome. And these, this thinking will take place, have no doubt about it. It's uh, not perfect. Uh, it can no doubt be more agile or surely more efficient, but be aware that people in high places in management ha are aware of the necessary changes. At the same time, we will need to provide the Alliance with a vision, with a direction to think about what I would call its purpose. That won't come as a surprise coming from me. We need to carry on thinking about how to strengthen the Alliance whilst seeking a balance between the technological innovation aspects and also the human aspects. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, challenges are huge. But let me reassure you, in fact, we have everything it takes to achieve that. Let me say that very clearly. There will be no success for the Renault Group without success for the Alliance. Now, regarding Renault. Let me tell you that I did not ask 
to become chairman of this company. But I accepted it because I thought that uh, there was a wonderful challenge and I wanted to serve this beautiful company where in just a few months I've discovered the passion of all team members. This is visible in the factories at the Techno Center and elsewhere. Unfortunately, I was not yet able to visit the whole group, as you can imagine, but what I could observe in the field filled me with happiness and hope. Beautiful industry, technology, and innovation. We have everything it takes to succeed. Believe me, as I speak to before you today, I am proud and happy and highly committed. It won't have escaped your notice, ladies and gentlemen, that the automotive industry is going through a totally new period with awesome challenges. You know them as well as I do, the environmental challenge that's been extensively covered, but it is incumbent upon us. It is our duty to design sustainable mobility for the future, which is environmentally friendly. We'll talk about that later. And we are also faced with radical societal transformation as evidenced by the digital revolution, which is affecting all sectors in particular that uh, the, automo the, the automotive sector. And also, as you know, we are also observing with tremendous speed the rise of new mobility, which is increasingly electrical, autonomous, connected and shared. I think that these are so many opportunities for the Renault Group, which already has a treasure trove of technology, which is only begging to be used and valued. I'm personally perfectly aware of the huge investment needed to achieve that. There are huge responsibilities which involve the whole company, but especially its management. Responsibility vis-a-vis future generations, of course, and maybe over the shorter term, vis-a-vis -vis our customers, partners, and investors. And above all, above all, vis-a-vis -vis our 183 co-workers throughout the world, and here once again, I would like to commend them for their huge talent. I'm incredibly proud of discovering this company gradually and to make it better known. For a few months, as you can imagine, I have visited most of the group's business, at least uh, the intellectual part. I would have liked to spend a little more time in the field. I was prevented from that by circumstances, but I could already see how extraordinarily committed the team is, the extraordinary work done by our employees, led by Mr. Bolloré, who is doing considerable work to enable Renault to be a leader in the automotive industry. The groundwork that we are laying is robust and it's only begging to grow. So of course, today we need to focus on quality, innovation and performance. All three aspects are absolutely interconnected. I wish for all employees of the group to be proud to lift their head up high, to be proud of being Renault employees of their products and services, and so that very quickly they all become the best ambassadors of the brand. To achieve that, we all know that beyond the technical expertise of our skills, our innovation capability, environmental and social responsibility has a major role to play. I must say, I already was aware of that, but I can confirm that Treno is a model in this area, and that only makes me more proud. When I was leading Entreprise pour Environnement, a great organization which for the 40 largest companies promotes the issue of the environment, I already knew that Treno was a leader in this field, and it was a reason to rejoice for me. So together, we are going to grow the Renault Group in terms of power and profitability, but also we'll make it more humane. Because a more humane 
company, a more ethical company, is a fundamental condition for trust, collective well-being, and therefore, obviously, for sustainable economic and social success. I have, I am convinced enough in this area to know how big the responsibility is on the leading bodies of the company, be it the supervisory board or the boards of directors before me, whom I'd like to welcome and I'd like to thank them for their support. Let me confess that it really touches me deeply. I would like to thank the managers of the company with the new executive board. They are driving Renault ever upwards. I've uh, written enough about the company's environmental and social responsibility last year with Nicole Nota in a report about the role of companies for collective well-being. I have too many beliefs about social dialogue, and I'm not going to change my beliefs now, ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholder. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will give the floor now to Mr. Bolloré. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of uh, Group Renault and with Jean-Dominique Senard, I am happy to welcome you for this new shareholders general meeting. Let me come back over the year 2018 and the few months of 2019 that have elapsed before I share the outlook with you. After 10 years of uninterrupted growth in the industry, the years 2018 and 2019 are now a breaking point. Collapse of some key markets for Renault like Turkey or Argentina, the closure of Iran, on towards currency exchange rates, acceleration in the change of the energy mix. But we were able to face these uh, headwinds. Before Clotilde Del Bos comes back over our performance in more detail, I would like to share with you the highlights. In 2018, we had record sales record revenues for an operating margin of 6.3% with a free cash flow that was positive. These results exceed the commitments that we made for the year. Moreover, we were profitable in all of our regions. In 2019, the economic situation deteriorated further with the decline of 6.7% of the global markets at the end of May. In spite of that, and thanks to excess performance, we maintained our market share at the global level, and we are convinced that we will remain in line with our commitments for 2019. If we can be resilient without being becoming too exhausted, well, that's due to uh, the robustness of our assets. There are many, but I would like to mention a major three, three pillars of our past and current performance. Our first asset is threefold strategic leadership in electric cars, LCVs, and our affordable vehicle range called 
global access. On the electric segment, we were pioneers 10 years ago. We are now leaders in Europe with 22% market share in 2018. In May 2019, our sales in Europe grew by 42% compared to the same period the previous year. Renault has 10 years of expertise, 230,000 electric vehicles on the road, 7,000 of which for car sharing and 30,000 people trained in electrical technology. We've extended our, our electrical expertise to hybrid vehicles by developing our own technology, e-tech, available from next year onwards on new Clio, Capture and Megan. E-tech is based on all the innovations that we have in terms of energy recovery developed in Formula One, harnessed for everybody in our production cars. Thus, as will be the case with new Clio, we'll offer up to 80% of driving time in pure electric mode, and we are the only ones doing that on the market. Last but not least, we have started our conquest of the segment outside Europe, especially in China. On this segment, China is now the single largest market and the one with the highest growth. In 2018, over two EVs out of three were sold there, or 77% more than in 2017. We are there, first thanks to the joint venture that we have with Nissan and Dongfang, which has paid off. Last April, we launched our 100% electrical city car, KZ, in Shanghai, a first milestone before it is marketed on other markets. Still in China, to bolster our presence there, we've also invested in JMEV, the fifth largest electric vehicle car maker in the country. Other area where Renault is a leader, LCVs, which account for 20% of our revenues. This is one of the highest growing and the most profitable segments where we have a full, renewed, electrified range sold in Europe and in the rest of the world. In 2018, we recorded historic performance with sales on the up by 3% compared to the previous year. This growth continued in 2019 with an increasing sales of 1.4% at the end of May. In Europe, we lead the van and the electric LCV segment a success, which is also confirmed this year. Every other uh, electric LCV sold in Europe is a Renault vehicle, so our goal is to extend our European leadership to the global level. We've laid the groundwork in China with the Renault Brilliance Jinbei Automotive joint venture. We've also launched Master in Korea. In 2016, we made a commitment to increase our sales of light commercial vehicles by 40% by 2022, raising that number to 770. 60,000 units sold. Given our organic growth and external growth operations, especially in China, we've already reached that volume goal that we'd set ourselves. Another leadership on the uh, segment of affordable vehicles, which is 100% Renault expertise, develop affordable vehicles tailored to the expectations of local markets. In our range, we have close to 20 models that have driven growth in Europe and in emerging countries. In 2018, that meant over 1.4 million vehicles sold, or over a third of the group's sales. This success was confirmed this year with duster sales in Europe, quit sales in Brazil, which were respectively up by 24 and 18% in April 2019, compared to the same period last year. By the end of our strategic plan, to drive the future, our goal is to have a full lineup renewal in order to support our ambition to move to 2 million units sold per year. This 100% Renault expertise has built our reputation and helped extend our geographical coverage whilst maintaining our rank on our legacy markets. And that's our second asset, a diversified geographical mix. In 2018, driven by the success of our models, over half of our sales were made abroad, outside of Europe. This trend should continue for this year. After a difficult first half of the year, the launches expected by December should drive our sales in Europe and in the world. In Europe first, where we launched new Clio, which accounts for a major step in terms of quality and technology, 
as well as new capture, which will be revealed next month. In Russia, we're launching Renault Arcana, an innovative concept of a crossover coupe, which will then be marketed in Korea and China. In China, by the way, as we said, we are also going to sell a 100% EV city car, KZE. And in India, we're going to launch Triber, an innovative vehicle that will create its own segment that will be revealed in New Delhi next week. Our global exposure and our wide segment coverage gives us the ability to absorb shocks, to smooth market hazards, and the alliance is only strengthening this resilience. This is our third strategic asset for the Renault Group's performance. Under the leadership of Jean-Dominique Senard, we are maintaining our shared actions with renewed, tighter, and more balanced governance. As seen from the operations of Renault Group, the Alliance is a key operational asset that underpins all of our ranges, platforms, modules, electronic architectures, autonomous driving, and electric vehicles. By 2022, 80% of our vehicles will be produced based on common platforms. Take new Clio, for instance, built on the new Alliance CMFB platform, Renault Clio offers more quality, technology, value, and performance. Because it is based on the diversity of sources of profit, market, and economies of scale in the Alliance, our performance pillars are robust and lasting. These fundamentals are necessary but not sufficient to deliver on our midterm strategic goals. The course is clear, let me remind you, by 2022, reach 70 billion in revenues for an operating margin higher than 7% with a positive free cash flow. We will deliver that whilst complying with future regulations. It's a real challenge at a time when at a time when markets are unstable with technological disruption and strong needs in terms of investment whilst we need to reduce our cost. In sum we need to be more attractive, more efficient, more innovative whilst being more competitive. How are we going about it? Well, by looking for new growth and performance drivers. First of all, we have set up a new team in the group's executive board. This new organization is part of a simplification, transparency, and acceleration approach in decision making. We are strengthening our customer focus from the product and service concept up to its full satisfaction. We have this collective mindset we are making decisions more quickly and more efficiently, similar to the transformation program at work in the company, and that's another performance driver. Indeed, at every level in the group, we are changing the way we work. For that, we have revised our values with the new Renault way. You can see the principles here, and I person personally care very strongly about them. At the same time, we are also revising all of our processes with a fast program concretely, pragmatically, daily, tool, teams have tools and methodologies to remove obstacles and work in a more cost-effective and collective way. The aim is to simplify, accelerate, and smooth the way we work, the consequence of that being an average reduction of 5% of our fixed costs per annum over the next three years. Naturally, this program is about generating cost savings whilst preparing for the future. And our future is based on attractiveness, quality, and innovation in vehicles and services. We are transforming. We are strengthening also our social, societal, and environmental role to become a car maker and a provider of mobility services. Our long-term performance also rests on that. Let's discover that with a short video. Mi nombre es María Milagros Cufre. Soy alumna del Instituto Técnico Reno. Es un, una escuela con orientación técnico-mecánico. Esta escuela está ubicada en la fábrica que Renault tiene dentro de Córdoba, que es la fábrica de San Isabel. Mi familia está vinculada con Renault debido a que mi papá y ahora mi hermana y mi hermano trabajan todos en un sector determinado de la fábrica de Renault de San Isabel. 
El colegio me aporta muchísimos conocimientos. Me encanta, es muy bueno. Primero tiene un nivel académico espectacular. Eh, es un ámbito muy cálido, la gente es muy comprensiva. Mis metas para el futuro son recibirme de ingeniera industrial, al igual que mi hermano, y también eh, de traductora de inglés, como mi hermana, que sería como una especie de mezcla entre los dos. Veo que son sueños capaz complicados, pero no son inalcanzables y que con mucho esfuerzo, dedicación, paciencia y mucho estudio los voy a poder lograr y sin ningún problema. Je m'appelle Johanna, j'ai 26 ans. J'ai commencé à travailler dans l'hôtellerie. Ça n'a pas été facile pendant 6 ans parce qu'il a fallu que je fasse des allers-retours en permanence, que ce soit en transport en commun ou en covoiturage ou des amis qui m'accompagnaient euh, euh, au travail. Donc ça a été 6 ans euh, très très dur. L'association Indy m'a proposé euh, ce projet avec Renault. Je n'ai pas hésité, je savais que ça allait changer ma vie. L'aide consiste à avoir une facilité de paiement pour les gens comme moi. Pour moi, c'était impossible d'acheter une voiture neuve en CDD. Donc du coup, on est en partenariat avec Renault et ils proposent de prêter des véhicules avec possibilité d'achat par la suite. Donc j'ai un crédit de 3 ans. À partir du moment que j'ai reçu ma voiture, bah, tout a changé. J'ai pu bah, me déplacer pour aller justement faire des entretiens dans le domaine que je voulais. C'est une satisfaction en fait, c'est une fierté et euh, une libération aussi surtout. Eh, mio nome è Metlica Marco, vigile del comando di Venezia, in servizio da 8 anni presso la, la sede di Mestre. Grazie alla formazione specifica ricevuta dalla Renault stiamo affrontando gli incidenti stradali con macchine elettriche in modo innovativo e più professionale. Dal momento della chiamata riconosciamo il veicolo, sappiamo quali sono le difficoltà, le trasmettiamo alla squadra durante il tragitto e arrivati sul posto dell'incidente riconosciamo l'autovettura e tramite l'applicativo Rescue Code riusciamo a affrontare l'incidente stradale su autovettura elettrica o ibrida nel modo più adeguato sia per l'occupante ma in particolare anche per gli stessi soccorritori. So as you just saw, uh, mobility is uh, quintessential for access to education, uh, work, and the economy as a whole. And for us, we believe that it's uh, uh, not just a duty, it's a responsibility. We take full uh, account of the effect of uh, mobility issues on people, on the environment, on the territories, and we try and come up with solutions. On road safety, we work with the fire brigade, and of course, uh, we also work on pollution with our electric cars. But uh, between 2010 and 2022, we decided, we committed to uh, bring our carbon footprint worldwide down by 25% throughout the life cycle of our cars, from uh, raw materials to uh, final uh, end of life with all the steps of recycling on the way. We have auditors uh, checking up on this. And last month, Renault was the first uh, car maker in the world that got a uh, validation of its uh, decarbonation uh, path until 2030 in line with the objectives of COP21. We are amongst the top three uh, leaders, uh, industrial leaders, with the lowest use of energy. And for the past 10 years, we've been uh, working on circular mobility, recycling or reusing parts and, and uh, materials from our cars in Europe. More than 30% of the materials used for the building of our cars come from recycling, and 95% uh, of the weight of our cars is either recycled or uh, monetized. Uh, our subsidiaries uh, in the environment department generated 500 million euros in uh, revenue, 200 million of which is used 
for repairs and after sales. And so our environmental responsibility is turned into a comp competitive asset at a time when the cost of raw materials has become an, a, um, a strategic challenge. Uh, we are working hard also on mobility for all, and that is the meaning of our commitment uh, in terms of uh, research and action tanks such as uh, Entreprise et Pauvreté or offering micro loans to purchase cars. We try and serve these societal and environmental objectives. And thus, we propose to serve the long term interests of this company. Uh, CSR is, in a way, a challenge that can help us improve our image. Uh, our attractiveness, but that this is also what drives our own people because the people working at Renault are at the heart of our performance and more than ever. Uh, we are working side by side with them. We are recruiting, training, supporting our people uh, and to prepare them for the future challenge challenges of mobility, as many as 4,700 people were recruited between 40, 27 and 2018. 230 million euros were invested in training, looking especially at the development of skills, what is what we call upskilling or reskilling. About 150 million euros were invested in improving the work environment at French workstations. And around the world in the year 2018, we recruited as many as 25,000 people, mostly uh, in manufacturing, so as to uh, reduce our. Uh, uh, resort to uh, third parties and in digital technologies, data management, uh, on board uh, electronics. We've made huge strides and we are hiring, of course, uh, many people to uh, make this happen and we're ready for tomorrow's uh, mobility uh, situation. The world is changing. We have autonomous driving. Mobility has become a service. People use the service rather than owning cars. This is a new situation, not, a, not the first time for Renault because we've been through a number of paradigm changes over the past 150 years. And for this, our role as uh, car, general car makers uh, is to contribute to tomorrow's mobility patterns uh, with uh, industrial solutions, manufacturing uh, solutions, accessible and affordable to all that will make the difference uh, on the wide skills. You know our vision. We expected it uh, through our three concept cars, Easy Go, Easy Pro, and Easy Ultimo. They are iconic in terms of uh, connected uh, autonomous and shared mobility. And in so doing, we are making urban mobility happen without uh, impact on the environment or indeed congestion uh, while uh, alleviating or at least um, uh, uh, relieving uh, public transportation. And this model is, uh, uh, can be repeated around the world. And we have been experimenting uh, in the field. We are offering uh, new services at Saclay. We have a new uh, uh, a la carte mobility service uh, using autonomous uh, driving and electric cars. In Paris, as many as 500 electric cars are available in carpooling that can be uh, booked uh, uh, with one click, with one app. In Madrid, we have a, a cooperation with the railway service and 600 electric Zoes. Uh, you have uh, more than 700 such cars around Europe, and this is only the start. Beyond uh, people mobility, we're working on uh, good uh, transportation. We have new delivery solutions with such concepts as EasyFlex, an experimental vehicle, 100% uh, electric autonomous car, which we are testing out with the post office. And this service, together with the cars and the vehicles we are developing, will be the ultimate driver for growth and performance. And that is what I wanted to tell you today. Now, the year 2018 was a challenging year, and uh, 2019 will be challenging as well. But Renault has solid foundations. We have the necessary assets and resources to turn these challenges into opportunities. One of our great strengths at Renault is the uh, loyalty and indeed the pride of being on, be belonging to this group. And I would like to pay tribute to the work of all our teams that have been working day and night to achieve the performance that Mrs. Delbos will now introduce in a detailed fashion. I should also like to thank you, our shareholders, for your trust. Uh, which has been carrying us year after year. Claudio, uh, take it away. Bonjour. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is for me to uh, present the sales and financial uh, performances for the year 2018 before uh, looking at the figures, the revenue figures for the first quarter of 2019. As Mr. Thierry just pointed out, we have uh, uh, met or indeed uh, exceeded the objectives announced at the beginning of the year. Let's look at the performance in 2018. In 2018, sales were up 3.2% uh, at 3.9 million units sold. This uh, figure includes, uh, since the 1st January 2018, the uh, sales of the Jinbei and Wesong uh, brands after the creation of a joint venture with Brilliance China Automotive. Uh, on a like-for-like -like basis uh, for 2017, sales would have been down 1.2 percent as TIV was down 0.3 percent. Let us look at uh, the situation by region in Europe. Our sales were better than ever in the history of our group, whereas growth was slightly better than the market. The growth was supported mostly by the B segment, Clio Capture Center and the new Duster Clio remains the second best-selling car in Europe and capture the first crossover in its category. Dacia has now has experienced a new record high uh, in Europe with a market share of 2.9 percent, and Group Renault is a leader on electric cars, on the electric car segment, with a market share of 22 percent. In Eurasia, sales were up 2 percent in a market that was down 2 percent. That uh, improvement is due to our good performance in Russia, which is the group's second market, where more than one car out of four is either Lada or Renault. Lada Vesta has become the best-selling vehicle in Russia. In Africa, medium, uh, Middle East and India, sales were down 15.8 percent, mostly because of the closure of the Iranian market and uh, uh, in the expectation of new uh, launches in what is a highly uh, highly uh, disputed market. In the Americas, sales were up 12.1 percent, even though there was a s serious degradation of the Argentinian market in H2. This, is a, this reflects the success of quid in the region and the good performance in Brazil, mostly. And Asia Pacifica, uh, Asia Pacific uh, recorded a 68 uh, percent increase in sales, including Jinbai and Huasong. On the like for like, we would have been down slightly. Let's look at the numbers for 2018, the financials. Uh, you have a, a summary uh, P&L here, an income statement. Uh, in 2018, our revenue was 57.4 billion euros, down 2.3 percent, but not including the negative forex effect. Uh, revenue would have been up 2.5 percent. Let's take a look at the contribution of the three uh, business areas. Number one, the uh, automotive division, not including Aftervas, revenue there was 51.2 billion, down 4.4 percent. This is mostly due to the uh, economic and geopolitical situation in a number of uh, markets outside Europe, and this has brought about a significant decline in volumes and currencies. But also, this was due to American sanctions, which have prompted us to stop our business in Iran starting in August, but we were able to limit the uh, negative effects uh, uh, through uh, price hikes uh, in emerging markets to absorb the currency effects, but also in Europe to pass on regulatory costs. The two other business areas, Aftervas and our bank, RCI, both exceeded 3 billion euros in con con contribution to our revenue. Let's look at the group uh, operating uh, margin. It is down 242 million euros to 3.6 billion. Uh, the consolidated operating uh, margin is 6.3 percent, down 0.3 percentage points compared to 2017. But that figure does include a change in our accounting standards, which has um, affected the operating margin by 0.2 percentage points. Let's look at the contributions of the three segments. Operating margin of the automotive section, not including aftervars, is down 545 million euros to 2.2 billion and accounts for 4.3 percent of sales. 
uh, not apart from the, ne the negative volume effect, this uh, is mostly due to an unfavorable environment, both in terms of currencies, because there's a minus 526 million euro effect, but also raw materials minus 356 million euros. To counter these negative effects, the group has continued pursued its policies of uh, increasing prices and keeping costs under control. After Vaz's contribution to operating profit was 204 million euros, or 6.5 percent of revenue, even though this improvement uh, benefited from uh, non-recurring uh, items, uh, this significant growth is, of course, the next stage in its recovery. Finally, RCI Bank had a record year in 2018 with a 1.2 billion euro contribution to the group's profit. That 14.7 percent increase is mostly due to the good uh, good sales performance, but also a, uh, a strict uh, control of costs. Uh, the contribution of related companies, mostly in Nissan, uh, was 1.5 billion euros in 2018, down 1.2 billion euros compared to the previous year. But the previous year had uh, in um, one-off. Um, proceed uh, uh, 1.1 1 .1 billion euros due to a tax reform voted uh, the previous year in the United States and a capital gain on the disposal of its stake in an equipment manufacturer. Other uh, costs and uh, other profits and um, expenditures uh, happened because of the crisis in Argentina and provisions for uh, the um, uh, the end of the program in France. Uh, the net profit after tax was 3.5 billion euros, uh, down 1.9 billion euros. Uh, last year, the uh, we had a positive oper op operating free cash flow upwards of 600 million euros, which of course improved our balance sheet position. Uh, the net position, the net cash position at the end of the year was 3.7 billion euros compared with 3.1 billion euros at end. 2017, in spite of a decline in the net profit in 2018, and that was because some one-off items did not recur, still, the board of directors felt that the sound financial position of the group made it possible for us to uh, suggest a, uh, to maintain the dividend in 2018 at the same level as 27, i.e. 3.55 euros per share. A few words about uh, revenue for the first quarter of 2019 as published in April. As you can see on this page, uh, the world market is down 7.2 percent over the first three months of the year. In this challenging context, the group decided to uh, manage to gain market shares uh, with down the, the decline in sales limited to 5.6 percent. Of course, if you correct this uh, for the closure of the Iranian market, the decline would have been only 1.7 percent. In Europe, sales were up 2 percent, even though the market as a whole was down 2.4 percent. And that is thanks to the good performance of Clio, new, the new Duster, Zoe, and LCVs. Internationally, the group was able to outperform the market in Eurasia, in America, in Africa, Media, Middle East, and India, uh, just as for Iran. The Asia-Pacific region suffered from a decline in Chinese demand. In this context, uh, revenue for the group for the first quarter of 2019 uh, was down 4.8 percent at 12.5 billion euros on, the li on, on an equal uh, exchange rate. Uh, the decline would have been only 2.7 percent. Revenue of the automotive decision, not including Aftervaz, was down 6.3 percent because of lower sales, uh, lower volumes and lower sales to partners, but also there were negative forex effects. Aftervaz continued to grow uh, with the contribution uh, up 7 percent at 767 million euros. Finally, uh, RCI's contribution to revenue was up 6.4 percent. Thank you for your attention. Merci. Well, thank you, Thierry, and thank you, Clotilde, for these very detailed uh, presentations. Uh, having heard uh, about the group's activity and its outlook, the time has come for us to address the issue of governance in this company. I would like to give the floor to Philippe Lagayette, who, in his capacity as lead director, will give you uh, the findings of 
the uh, board of directors uh, up until my appointment in uh, April 2019 on the issue of governance. And then I will tell you about developments since I was appointed. Then I will give the floor to Mrs. Marie-Annick Darmayak, who in her capacity as head of the compensation committee will uh, give her, uh, her committee's findings on compensation. Philippe Laguerre now. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. In my capacity as a lead director, it is for me to um, present the uh, members of uh, the board and the work uh, conducted by the board in uh, the year 2018 and the beginning of 2019. In 2018, uh, the Board of Directors of Renault had 19 members, including 10 independent uh, directors, uh, or 66.7% 66 of independent directors, uh, as accounted uh, using the uh, standard formula that is not counting um, staff members. Now, let, uh, let us look at the uh, membership and the decisions of the board since the last AGM. Since the last AGM, Mr. Pascal Faure, a director appointed uh, at the request of uh, the French government, resigned uh, on October 5th. He was replaced by Mr. Thomas Courbe, who was co-opted by the board, again upon proposal by the French government. Uh, Mr. Cobb was initially an expert uh, from the uh, aeronautic industry, and he is now uh, in charge of the um, corporate department at the Ministry of Economy and Finance, has been since, 20, since 27 August 2018. The board also appointed provisionally, that is uh, subject to uh, ratification by this AGM, decided then to appoint Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard in his capacity as a director uh, on 24 January last, so as to uh, appoint him as chair, chair of the chairman of the board uh, as part of the succession uh, process that started after Mr. Gohn's uh, departure. Uh, Moreover, uh, the terms of three members will end after this AGM. Mr. Carlos Gon, on April 2nd last, uh, told the board that he intended to put an end to his term as uh, director after uh, the end of this AGM because of his continued inability to attend and due to the fact that there are limits to his movements. Mrs. Sherry Blair's term will also come to an end at the end of this AGM, and my own term as a director will end today, and it will not be possible to uh, renew this mandate because I have reached the uh, statutory age limit. And so uh, we are now putting to your approval the ratification of Mr. Thomas Courbe's appointment and that of Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard as directors. Moreover, uh, it is uh, suggested to uh, approve the appointment of Mrs. Annette Winkler in her capacity as a new uh, director upon recommendation of the Appointments and Governance Committee. Mrs. Annette Winkler was managing director of a Daimler uh, subsidiary between 2010 to September 2018. Subject to approval of these appointments, the board then uh, will include, after this uh, AGM, 18 members, 71.4% uh, of which uh, of them independent, uh, with uh, Mrs. Vaclair's appointment the proportion of women on the board will stand at 46.7%. Now, a few words about the activity of the board in 2018. Throughout the year 2018, the board uh, examined the three uh, uh, following strategic issues. Uh, human capital of the group and the three pillars of the HR policy, 
as part of the Drive the Future strategic plan. Uh, we also examine the group's strategy in terms of um, electric cars and uh, hybridation, hybridation technologies. And the board also uh, examined uh, the aspects of uh, IT and digitalization, the main challenges ahead, the way in which uh, the, the group is be being digitalized and the way uh, in which this has improved uh, the company's performance. Now, let's look in closer detail at the work of uh, the board after the arrest of Mr. Ghosn that occurred on 19 November last. The, um, this uh, included three aspects. Uh, the immediate uh, introduction of a provisional, of provisional governance, uh, verifications and audits uh, in the group, and uh, a new, uh, new governance. To complete this work, the board met on four occasions between 19 November 2018 and 24 January 2019. The committees uh, met on seven separate occasions. During that time, on top of uh, board meetings, there were five informal uh, information meetings for uh, directors, and uh, they dealt uh, in particular uh, with the work of the Audit, Risk, and Ethics Committee, uh, known as CARE, and this is the word, the name I will be using from now on, but we also looked at the work of the Appointments and Governance Committee. So the uh, first aspect was a provisional uh, governance. When uh, the, the announcement came of Mr. Ghosn's uh, arrest, uh, the board immediately introduced provisional governance uh, measures to ensure the preservation of the group's interest and the continuation of its operations. The board decided to meet as often as, as necessary um, under the chairmanship of the lead director, and on 20 November 2018 decided to appoint Mrs. Thierry Belloré in as um, deputy managing director and uh, ask him to be in charge of uh, an executive charge of uh, the group. Regarding uh, verification uh, missions, the board of directors, upon recommendation of the care committee, uh, requested as early as 23 November that the ethics and compliance uh, department should conduct uh, verifications on those items of uh, compensations of uh, the group, uh, the group's uh, top uh, managers, and to extend this to uh, issues uh, regarding, or rather, extending this to pr procedures in terms of expenses at uh, presidency and top management level, as well as operations uh, with third parties, which you may have read about. Uh, in parallel, Renault and Nissan also um, commissioned a joint audit on their uh, joint uh, Dutch uh, subsidiary, RNBV, as of uh, 6 February 2019. Uh, in the period between 20 November 2018 to May 2019, the care committee met on nine occasions to supervise uh, these uh, uh, verifications and the mission that was uh, conducted by the Ethics and Compliance Department uh, prompted us to um, bring uh, a number of alerts to the attention of the French judicial authorities. Uh, first, the um, uh, counterpart of a convention, of a sponsorship convention between Renault and uh, the Versailles Castle, which uh, personally benefited to Mr. Ghosn. Uh, number two, uh, payments made to a Lebanese lawyer, and then payments to the benefit of a Renault importer based in the Middle East. The board invited general management to put in place measures in order to prevent similar situations in the future especially in terms of internal organization. The joint audit made on RNBV now 
highlighted a certain number of deficiencies in terms of financial transparency and expenditure control procedures at RNBV. The Board of Directors therefore requested that general management of Renault liaise with Nissan in order to decide at the level of RNBV about the necessary corrective measures. This joint audit, and it could only be a joint audit because it is a 50-50 affiliate. This joint audit also confirmed the uh, questions raised regarding the uh, statutory purpose of RNBV about uh, the uh, relevance of a certain number of expenditures committed by RNBV over a period of about 10 years for a total amount of around 11 million euros, which cover travel for Mr. Gorm by plane, some personal expenditures made by Mr. Gorm, and also donations that benefited non-profit organizations. In view of these observations, the boards of directors asked Renault representatives at RNBV to consider, in tandem with their Nissan opposite numbers, to start legal and uh, action and lawsuits uh, by RNBV available in the Netherlands. Let me come to the third part, the uh, creation of the new governance. The group's new governance was set up on the 24th of January. At that date, the board of directors took note of Mr. Gorn's decision to end his terms as chairman and CEO. And upon recommendation from the Appointments and Governance Committee, the Board of Directors decided to choose to dissociate the two functions in the future. It deemed that this structure is more appropriate for Renault's current challenges because you can both benefit from the stature and expertise in terms of corporate governance of a chairman and the managerial uh, background and expertise, industrial and automotive expertise of a CEO. This dissociation went hand in hand with changes in the bylaws of the board, creating a new distribution of powers between the chairman and the CEO. Beyond a chairman's usual missions, the chairman is now given at Renault a specific role in the management of the alliance in connection with the CEO. Now the CEO still has management and decision-making powers uh, that are as extensive as possible in terms of Renault regarding the alliance, the alliance. He is in charge of coordinating the alliance's activities in the operational realm under the authority of the chairman. Then the board selected candidates for the functions of chairman and CEO and did that based on the criteria selected by the Appointments and Governance Committee, amongst which in particular flawless ethical reputation, recognized international experience, good knowledge of the automotive world, a culture of innovation, charisma, and leadership. At the end of this process, the functions of chairman were given to Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard, and the function of CEO were given, was given to Mr. Thierry Bolloré. As part of this new governance, the board has already decided to maintain a lead director whose mission would be in particular to substitute for the chairman in his absence, to prevent conflicts of interest, and to work for Renault's good governance. The new lead director will be appointed based on a proposal by the Appointments and Governance Committee amongst the independent directors during a, a future meeting of the Board of director, Directors. The last aspect of this presentation will be about the Board's assessment. 
the annual assessment was conducted this year, like every year, and it was an opportunity to learn the lessons of recent events and to re-examine the ways the board and its committees work. The board took account of some avenues for improvement, and these avenues included, in particular, a proposal to appoint as director people with experience in the automotive world. And the proposal to appoint Ms. Annette Winkler is in keeping with this goal. What's more, directors expressed the desire to spend more time thinking about strategic guidance as well as CSR. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I think one can say that the company reacted quickly and as effectively as possible to the unexpected shock that it felt. The provisional management was put in place immediately and worked well. And in two months, a definitive management team was put in place. Therefore, the board of directors was intensely mobilized so that the disruption to the company's working was reduced to a minimum. I would like to warm-heartedly thank all directors and general management of the company who supported me in this action. In particular, during this challenging period, I could check that Renault has the necessary resources to face unexpected situations of all natures and the ability to organize itself consequently. Uh, of course, uh, next steps are no longer my concern because my term as director is expiring today, but I trust the company's management with support from shareholders to defend Renault's interests as best as possible in a period filled with challenges and opportunities. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Philippe. Thank you, Philippe, for this very comprehensive presentation. Uh, since you're leaving, I would like once again to say that uh, life at uh, Group Renault uh, since 2010 has not always been smooth sailing. And in the latest period, uh, everyone knows things were difficult for the company. In this period, and uh, I can testify about it since I uh, became chairman, Mr. Laguillette was always very available, very open-minded, and he helped me over these uh, few weeks where I got to learn about the group's environment, both inside and outside, especially uh, about the goings-on at uh, the board of directors. I would like to thank him for that. Thank him for being so delicate with me and, and tactful with me and other board members. I won't take too much time, ladies and gentlemen, just to say that this current governance, which has been renewed, relies on a belief that we all have that functional governance is absolutely key for effective accountability of the various management and control bodies of a group. Even more fundamentally, it's also a very strong signal beyond symbols for trust within the company. This is with this rationale in mind that we've decided to slightly amend the group's governance with a requirement for balance, uh, diversity in skills and profiles, whilst being based on robust ethics. As Philippe recalled, we've decided to split the functions of uh, CEO and chairman of the board, still with a lead director. I care about that because I serve as lead director within the board of directors of Saint-Gobain. I know how useful this function is. 
On the one hand, it helps provide a twofold guarantee in terms of checks and balances and ethical governance. And also, amongst other things, it helps have a dedicated and preferred contact for shareholders. Well, the board of directors, which has met many times since I arrived uh, at the helm uh, since uh, the 24th of January, had to make a number of difficult decisions. And as far as I can tell, it is driven by very agile, free, and uh, lively spirits. And these meetings of the board of directors are always a very pleasurable moment because I have an impression that we are all working as a team. And uh, I'd like to thank them for that because it makes our lengthy meetings so much more equanimous and uh, pleasurable. Uh, we talked about the changes of the board. Philippe said what I wanted to say. Uh, Miss Blair is also going to leave us. I wanted to express our gratitude to her. We were not on the board uh, together for a very long time, but I wanted to say that all of our comments were always based on uh, British humor, a certain demanding quality, and they were always highly relevant. And let me thank her for that, for all of that she did. And also, of course, I'm really happy, really, really happy to welcome Annette Winkler, because the conversations that we've had since she's uh, been uh, proffered as a candidate to join us, well, uh, she showed that she would contribute uh, a tremendous knowledge of the automotive world and a very sharp mind that uh, I have no doubts about. With this new changing governance, we wanted to make our work smoother, especially the work of the committees. And let me tell you, we want better accountability of governing bodies. Talking about accountability there, I mean actual accountability being taken to account. We've created a new governance and remunerations committee that will be chaired by Patrick Thomas, which is the outcome of the merger between the appointments and governance committee with the remunerations committee. It seemed that it would be more logical and easier to work in this context and avoid duplication of work with greater consistency, as I said. We also have a new ethics and CSR committee, which will be chaired by Marie Annick Darmanac. This has some implications because a specialized CSR committee immediately gives a focus that I would like to set for the board's work, making it a full fledged topic that really shows the group's DNA and the prospects that we have to improve that responsibility in the future. Then the board will monitor much more closely the ambitious yet realistic goals that we've set in all these areas, in particular in the area of the circular economy, to name but one of the most important. And last but not least, a new Audit Risk and Compliance Committee, uh, which will be chaired by Pascal Souris. We know how important the role of that committee is. It plays a central role in the life of the board. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, I'd like to thank you. And now, throw it over to Marianique Darmayac, who will report on matters of managers' remuneration and the remuneration policy. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to explain the elements of remuneration of the corporate officers. You will be asked to vote on this AGM on several aspects. First of all, the final remuneration items attributed to Mr. Gorn for the fiscal year 2018. These elements being granted based on the remuneration policy approved at the general meeting dated 15 June 2018. Then on Mr. Gorn's remuneration policy for the beginning of the fiscal year 2019 and then the remuneration policies for the fiscal year 2019 for Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard as chairman of the board and Mr. Thierry Bolloré as chief executive officer. 
first of all, I would like to present the remuneration elements for Mr. Gorn during the fiscal year 2018. The remuneration policy for Mr. Gorn for that year included fixed pay of 1 million euros, variable pay, the amount of which could reach up to 100% of fixed pay, or 1 million euros, provided that criteria, performance criteria were met. Let me uh, point out that only 20% of Mr. Gorn's variable pay can be paid in cash. The rest was to be paid in a deferred manner in shares, provided that he was with the comp still with the company three years after the actions, the shares vested. Then Mr. Gorn could benefit from 80,000 performance shares, provided that he was still with the company four years later. All of uh, Mr. Gorn's annual fixed pay for 2018, or one million euro grow in gross terms, was paid. Regarding his variable pay, the board assessed uh, Mr. Gorn's performance and decided on the overall achievements rate for the performance criteria, which was 89.6%. After applying the criteria defined in the 2018 remuneration policy that the council has to apply, the board mm, observed that the 75% of Mr. Gorn's variable pay to be paid with a deferred delivery of shares based on the presence cannot be paid since he left the group on the 23rd of January this year. Only 25% of his variable remuneration can be paid. The board set this amount to a gross amount of 224,000 euros. That being said, the board decided that the questions highlighted by the verification mission decided within Euro and RNBV regarding a certain number of operations initiated by Mr. Gorn should be taken into consideration. Therefore, the board decided not to recommend to shareholders to vote in favour of the tenth resolution regarding Mr. Gorn's compensation for the fiscal year 2018. Let me remind you of that a rejection of that resolution will prohibit the payment of Mr. Gorn's variable pay for the fiscal year 2018. What's more, given that Mr. Gorn put an end to his term as uh, chairman and CEO on the 23rd of January, the board observed a loss of his right for the final delivery of shares due as payment for his deferred variable pay for the fiscal years 2014 to 2017 and performance shares granted during the fiscal years 2015 to 18. The board also decided to waive the non-compete clause signed by Mr. Gorn and consequently will not pay him the corresponding indemnification, which is uh, two years of fixed and variable pay. Then regarding the defined contribution, the defined payment pension scheme, the uh, board observed that Mr. Gorn's uh, conditions of leaving were not covered by any uh, of the conditions of that regime, and so no pension will be paid to him. Uh, Mr. Gorn, it should be noted, challenged the board's decisions regarding his remuneration for 2018. As regards Mr. Gorn's remuneration policy for FY 2019, the board reached a decision on that insofar as he served in his functions up until the 24th of 23rd of January. But given the inability to serve that he was subject to since the beginning of the year until he ended his term, the board decided that no remuneration would be paid or granted for the fiscal year 2019. As part of the governance change for Renault, the Remunerations Committee met several times to decide on the new uh, compensation policies for the chairman and general manager. The committee relied on studies and benchmarks prepared by external consultancies and took account of the government's recommendations in terms of remuneration for chairman and CEO for companies with a government uh, part ownership. The split between the functions of chairman and CEO, the specific missions given to the chairman within the alliance and the changes in career for Mr. Thierry Bolleray within Renault were also taken into account in the drafting of the new remuneration policies. 
the board approved the recommendations of the compensation committee and decided on the remuneration policies that I'm going to explain to you now. Regarding Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard's remuneration policy, the board decided to grant him fixed annual pay for gross fixed annual pay for 450,000 euros, paying him both for his traditional functions as chairman of the board and specific missions for coordination and representation within the alliance. In line with good governance practices, Mr. Sina will not benefit from any variable or exceptional remuneration or for, from any free performance shares. Regarding Mr. Thierry Bolloré's remuneration policy, the board decided to organize his remuneration in the following manner. A gross annual fixed pay of 900,000 euros, 10% lower than the former CEO's annual fixed pay, variable remuneration which couldn't reach 125% of fixed pay or 1.125 million euros, subject to annual quantitative and qualitative criteria, and long-term remuneration of uh, 50,000 performance shares for the fiscal year 2019, the final delivery of which will be subject to the achievement of performance criteria gauged over three years and uh, subject to Mr. Bolloris' presence within the group at the end of this period. This remuneration structure expresses a correlation between performance and compensation. It includes a major risk component based on demanding stable, verifiable, and quantifiable criteria, both over the short and long term. In its work, the group has changed the definition and the weighting of the performance criteria applicable to the, determin to the determination of Mr. Bolloré's variable pay in order to better align quantitative criteria on the guidance disclosed by the company to the markets. Regarding quantitative criteria, the share of group operating margin was raised from 30 to 40 percent and the return on equity rate was replaced by the group's revenues, which accounts for 30 percent of overall, of overall performance. The variable part that can account for 125 percent of uh, his remuneration's fixed pay, quantitative criteria can lead to a variable pay that can reach 100 percent of fixed pay. Regarding qualitative criteria, and there are three of them, have equal weightings and they can account for an additional variable part that can reach 25% of fixed pay. Criteria perform performance criteria applicable to the determination of uh, long-term remuneration for the CEO are identical to those decided on in 2018. The CEO will not have any severance pay if the decide if the company decided to activate his non-compete clause, he will receive a uh, package equal to two years of gross annual pay. Mr. Bolloré will still benefit from the additional pension scheme put in place by the company for the members of the executive committee. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marie-Annick. I realize one thing, and I hope that Olivia Q will not begrudge me. I forgot to talk about her. Because uh, earlier I introduced uh, innovations in terms of uh, committee governance, and I forgot to say uh, what was constant, what remained. And the strategic committee is uh, not a lesser committee, and of course it's still there, uh, highly sought after by uh, members of the board. Uh, let me uh, tell you, and Olivia Q is a brilliant chair for that. Sorry for forgetting you, Olivia. Now I would like to invite Mr. Émeric de la Morandière from Ernst & Young to present a summary of uh, the reports of the statutory auditors. Please come on stage, sir. Il arrive l'autre côté. Voilà, c'est ça. Très bien. Mesdames. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I will now read a summary of the reports that uh, we prepared for your attention for this ordinary and extraordinary general meeting. These reports were made available by the company 
Therefore, I shall only read the highlights of these reports. For the fiscal year 2018, our reports looked at the annual accounts, consolidated accounts, remuneration of participatory shares, and also regulated conventions. Uh, for the extraordinary general meeting, we issued two special reports on capital operations. Let me start with the report on the annual accounts. We unreservedly certified the annual accounts for the fiscal year 2018. The key audit point for the annual accounts is the assessment of the participatory shares and associated debt. Regarding the consolidated accounts, we also unreservedly certified the consolidated accounts for 2018. We issued one observation to remind the reminder, the readers of the financial statement that in the annexes there is a description of the impact of the changes in accounting standards after the first application of IFRS 15 on the recognition of products and the IFRS 9 on the assessment evaluation of financial instruments and the change in methods for uh, the recognition of participatory shares. Our checks on the accounts uh, included the groups on risks and uh, they were implemented in the significant entities of the group and the significant operations that may have the material incidence on the consolidated accounts overall. Given the uh, European reform for audit, we have developed in our report the key audit points for the Renault group and uh, the audit response given to any of these points. There were key, four key audit points, the recoverable value of specific industrial assets of the automotive sector, excluding aftervas. The second one was about uh, the booking method and the recoverable value uh, for Renault's investment in Nissan. The third one was about the recoverable character of deferred tax assets for French fiscal integ tax integration. And the last one was about the calculation of the expected losses on uh, the um, sales financing debt. IFRS 9 expects uh, to uh, book a loss uh, for a healthy debt uh, applying a prospective uh, default risk model. For each of these points, we have reviewed the accounting methods that were used and we looked at the reasonable character of the estimates made by Renault. Regarding the management's report, we made specific verifications as per the law. We did not have any observations about the uh, truthfulness and uh, the consistency of the information given uh, in the management's report with the accounts. For the extraordinary part, we issued two reports. The first one covered by Resolution 4 about the participatory shares. There we certify that uh, the uh, remuneration, uh, variable remuneration of these uh, shares uh, matches uh, the terms of the issuance contract and the uh, figurative elements coming from the group's consolidated accounts. The second report is on regulated conventions and commitments between your company and its uh, corporate officers or with companies with shared directors. Three new conventions were subject to preliminary authorization by the board. The first one is about the second rider to the master cooperation agreement signed between your company uh, Nissan, Daimler, Renault, Nissan BV, and Mitsubishi Motors. The second and third conventions are on commitments made by your company to Mr. Thierry Bolloré for a non-compete convention and a commitment made in terms of additional pension scheme. We're also presenting in our report the conventions and commitments that were approved in previous fiscal years and that were continued in 2018. Then, for the extraordinary parts of the general meeting, we issued two special reports regarding resolutions that may have a, an impact on the share capital. These operations are covered by the uh, Code of Commerce, and so we have no specific observations or comments on these operations. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. de la Morandière. And now, uh, I would like to give the floor to Jean-Benoît de Vosges, who will uh, introduce the uh, resolutions on the agenda of this meeting. Mesdames, Messieurs, les actions. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have as many as 19 resolutions, 17 for the ordinary uh, AGM and two for the extraordinary uh, meeting. In line with legal requirements, the documents uh, for shareholders were made available uh, at the appointed time at the head headquarters and on the website. You have in particular the uh, explanations of the resolutions based on the findings of the uh, board of directors, information on directors whose appointment or renewal is on uh, offer, the reports of the auditors, details of the share buyback program, and uh, a table uh, presenting the performance of the company over the past five years. If there are no objections, I, I propose not to read out the reports that were made available, which you can also find in the 2018 registration document and the invitation leaflet. Starting with the ordinary uh, resolution. Re resolution number one proposed to approve the annual accounts for the year 2018 with a profit of 1.172611191 uh, euros, 1,171,000,000. This is Renault SA, so the consolidated performance of Renault. And uh, uh, the next resolution is the approval of the consolidated accounts for the year 2018 with a net profit of 3,450,820,372 uh, euros and 14 cents. Resolution number three is the uh, allocation of the profits for year, to year 2018 would have a dividend of 3.55 dividend uh, per share, which will be uh, made in June 2019. Resolution number four is uh, to note the findings of the auditors on uh, redeemable shares on the compensation of re redeemable shares. The uh, next convention is the provisions on related party agreements based on Articles L22, 225.38 of the Code of Commerce. Resolution number six is a related party agreement uh, on the Code of, on the, uh, sorry, Based on Article L22.25.38 of the Code of Commerce, it's a second amendment to the Master Cooperation Agreement between Nissan uh, and uh, Daimler and Renault and Mitsubishi. The next resolution is the co-optation of uh, the um, Mr. Thomas Courbe in uh, uh, his uh, capacity as director. Resolution number eight is the to ratify the, nom the appointment of Jean-Dominique uh, Sena in his uh, capacity as director. Num resolution number nine is to appoint Mrs. Annette Vinclair as uh, director until 2023. Resolution number 10 is a compensation uh, paid to Mr. Carlos Gon in his capacity as CEO for the year 2018. Uh, it was told, we told you that the Board of Directors uh, vote, uh, recommends to vote against that resolution. Resolution 11 is the compensation co policy for Mr. Carlos Ghosn in his capacity as CEO for the year 2019. Resolution number 12 is the uh, compensation policy or policy compensation criteria for Jean-Marie uh, Sina as chairman of the board for the year 2019. Resolution number 13 is to vote on the compensation criteria for Mr. Thierry Bolloré in his capacity as CEO for the year 2019. Resolution number 14 is the approval of the non-competition um, clause to the benefit of Mr. Bolloré um, in his capacity as CEO. Resolution 15 regards the uh, pension benefits for Mr. Benoré Bolloré as CEO. Resolution number 16 is to authorize the Board of Directors to conduct operations on company shares for a period of 18 months for no more than 10 percent of the share capital. This is to enable the company to implement its share buyback program. This uh, we have now 
two uh, resolutions that re uh, refer to the extraordinary meeting. Resolution 17 is to authorize the board to reduce the company's share capital by canceling its own shares within t uh, a ceiling of 10% of the share capital. And uh, uh, this is based on the previous resolution regarding the share buyback program. And the 18th resolution is to allow the board of directors to grant free shares to company employees or executive officers. Uh, that uh, uh, would be for a period of no more than 38 months and uh, uh, within 2% of the share capital uh, within an annual uh, amount of 0.67% of the share capital. And then the 19th resolution is the ordinary resolution to allow the uh, board to conduct uh, all formalities needed to implement the uh, aforementioned resolutions. Well, thank you, uh, Jean-Benoit, for uh, completing, for discharging this challenging task. The time has come for us to have a uh, debate with uh, our shareholders. And this is when we have a Q&A uh, session. And uh, I believe we're supposed to uh, mark time now. Right. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, start with the Q&A uh, session, let me tell you that the answers to questions put to us in writing can be found on our website under the heading uh, Annual AGM 2019. Jean-Benoit de Vosges will give you instructions uh, for uh, the uh, Q&A session. Thank you, sir. And so to allow as many people as possible to take the floor. We would like you to keep your questions to no more than one minute. We'll find uh, young men and women with microphones around the room. Uh, please remain seated. And if you wish, wish to put a question, just raise your hand. Somebody will give you a microphone, and you will be told when you can speak. And now I give the floor to the chairman of the floor to chair this Q&A session. Thank you, Jean-Benoit. Well, before we... Uh, start the discussion. Let me start with a question from an advisory member of uh, the um, Shareholders Committee. Uh, we had uh, a meeting of the well, Shareholders Committee in May. Uh, these days, by the way, are very useful because we can have useful exchanges. Uh, in that, on that occasion in May, together with Mr. Bolloré and members of the Executive Committee, we discussed the activity of the group, the outlook, uh, current affairs, and there was a, a candid exchange, uh, which uh, we believe was very fruitful. Uh, of course, uh, it would be good for such events to uh, continue. Uh, they were uh, very lively on the 14th of May, and here has here's a quick video uh, summing up that event. Je crois que ce genre de journée assez exceptionnelle est très importante. Merci de votre présence, merci de votre implication et de votre fidélité à, à, à Renault. Cette rencontre m'a permis de connaître M. Sénard qui est tout nouvellement arrivé. Je suis très contente de rencontrer les dirigeants de Renault. Et aujourd'hui, je pense que ce qui était important, c'est qu'ils nous rassurent sur l'avenir de, de l'Alliance. Je suis confiant parce que je pense qu'aujourd'hui, ce ne serait même pas concevable que chaque marque puisse revenir en arrière. On voit trop l'interdépendance, ne serait-ce que par exemple sur la Clio, où on voit plein de, de technologies de l'Alliance partagées avec Nissan. Moi, ce que j'en attendais, c'était aussi de voir comment l'entreprise allait vers le futur. Que ça bouge beaucoup, il y a une transformation numérique, il y a des start-up qui vont très très vite. Elle a toujours su surmonter les, les obstacles et les handicaps, donc euh, je fais confiance. C'est un pionnier, Renault. Euh, il y a 100 ans ou 150 ans qu'on fait des voitures tout de même, donc il ne faut pas se laisser dépasser. Voilà. Well, there you have it. We uh, shouldn't be overwhelmed uh, or overtaken by events. Uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to the representative, Mr. Duval, who represents uh, the Shareholders Committee, the uh, representative uh, advisory committee. He, I believe Mr. Duval is in the back of the room, and I believe he has a question, but 
uh, someone should give him a microphone. Yes, apparently Mr. Duval's microphone is out of order, so we'll give him another uh, microphone. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Directeur, Mesdames, Messieurs. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm an individual shareholder and I'm a member of the shareholders committee. Can you tell us more about the fiat operations and the reason why it didn't work out? Well, uh, even if you hadn't asked, I would have told you about it. So thank you for putting the question. I, I don't want to be too lengthy, but I would like to be uh, comprehensive. Uh, the first thing you should know is the general context. It is not for me to uh, describe the general context of the automotive industry, but it is facing major challenges. And as you know, we are at the threshold of a major technological development. There are major issues uh, in terms of strategies, uh, uh, the type of investment that will be required, uh, and that uh, will involve huge sums of money uh, that will need to be uh, spent in the years to come. So that context is well known. One thing is less well known, and I would like to share it with you. Uh, at this stage, we are facing a new era where a uh, significant restructuring of the market is about to uh, happen, especially because of the new uh, role played by the Chinese automotive industry. Uh, over the past few years, this uh, change was uh, still uh, uh, out there. It wasn't very precise. It was, uh, and we considered it with some skepticism. And uh, we were sort of uh, uh, considering developments in the Chinese industry. But uh, 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 there's no. Uh, we, 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 we can't be as skeptical anymore. Those of you who attended the latest motor show in Tokyo know that uh, there's a growing number in Chinese car makers and cars built by the Chinese industry uh, are, uh, are, are high quality vehicles uh, with uh, significant uh, digital uh, technological progress. There were connected cars. This We're not blaming anyone, but this uh, fact is there for us to consider. And so we are facing a period where uh, this the emergence, the exclusion, this uh, development, this, uh, this blooming of the Chinese industry will result in a form of earthquake uh, and a tsunami that will, uh, that, 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 that will uh, affect uh, the uh, the industry here. I don't mean to tell you about my past, but I used to run the Michelin company, and between 2012 and 2018, uh, Chinese tires uh, in Europe uh, went up from a 5% to a 30% market share. There, in, f in a matter of five years, the market share for a Chinese tire uh, grew sixfold, and uh, what is going to happen uh, for the uh, automotive industry is uh, of the same uh, of the same kind and uh, it is well i have a duty uh, to my shareholders and if i and you would be right to hold it against me if we didn't uh, make the necessary adjustments now uh, we are all facing that same situation and when uh, the Chinese onslaught happens. We have to be strong enough to uh, withstand it and resist it and be able to keep uh, operating on a um, on an equal footing, on at least uh, a, um, a level playing field. Now, when I was uh, asked to make contact with the leaders of Fiat Chrysler's, uh, Chrysler, we did so. We uh, uh, worked with these people. We did some uh, remarkable work, but I realized very quickly uh, that uh, there, there were 
well, the, 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 there was a, a um, uh, attractive opportunity, not just for Renault, but for the Alliance as a whole. And indeed, uh, the, I, I believe that the two, Renault and the Alliance, are inseparable. But the great advantage of a, a rapprochement with Fiat uh, were pretty obvious in, in my career in industry. Seldom have I seen a, an opportunity for a, a merger uh, that uh, brought with it so many uh, valuable uh, synergies and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, robust uh, growth opportunities. And uh, looking at the detail, we found that uh, synergies could definitely be achieved. And they offered one specificity. We were not looking at uh, uh, synergies that would translate into uh, layoffs and, uh, and, um, and human tragedy. Uh, because I'm, I, I know what that can be like. But there we were looking at positive synergies. We're looking at manufacturing uh, and production synergies, uh, which uh, would also benefit the Renault platform. So this was uh, a, a very promising development. And so uh, plus, of course, uh, there we were in a position to bring in uh, very prestigious uh, brands, uh, Fiat, Chrysler, Maserati, Alfa, Alfa Romeo, Jeep, uh, bring them in the same family as our own uh, brand. And that, of course, uh, brought a, a unique opportunity because it meant that we were in a position, we would have been in a position uh, to focus uh, uh, on our effort to uh, keep the, uh, the brand promise, the promise of the Renault brand. And so we're looking at, uh, of course, the Renault brand, but uh, in a well-defined context. And so we could have been uh, much more focused on that. And so there were many opportunities. I could tell you also about uh, synergies in terms of uh, research, the fact that we could bring our, our, uh, our clout as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a, a research uh, powerhouse. But uh, of course, uh, when we were told about this possibility, of course, we turned to uh, Nissan. We recognized that there was very little time, but there was little we could do because we were under a, uh, a, an extreme uh, time pressure. And uh, we involved the, the, the board of directors that uh, put in days of hard work uh, considering uh, that offer, uh, bringing in the finest experts of the Renault Group. And so we arrived uh, at a situation where well, the board of director that could have uh, voted in favor of the first stage of that merger, uh, that, of course, uh, was a, a non-binding commitment. Uh, it had to be, of course, uh, to be completed with additional work uh, in September and turn that into a binding agreement. But uh, that board meeting was such that uh, uh, all members of the board uh, were given an opportunity to speak and uh, with the exception of uh, uh, one vote against, uh, all, uh, all members of the board uh, enthusiastically approved that, uh, that opportunity, opportunity. And the two representatives of the Nissan group abstained, but in a positive way. And in saying so, I would really like to thank uh, the members of uh, the um, uh, Nissan group uh, sitting on the board who worked hard and fast, uh, literally, on uh, this uh, uh, this opportunity. They, they recognized that uh, uh, this was certainly to the benefit of uh, Renault. They didn't know what uh, it held for uh, Nissan, although I believe there was something to be gained by Nissan as well. But at least that opened the way for the first uh, validation of that uh, merger or that offer. It just turned out that uh, the uh, representative of the French uh, government did not uh, see eye to eye with us. And, uh, uh, and so the vote um, couldn't happen after all, which uh, I must say I find extremely unfortunate. Of course, uh, a lot has been said about this in the media. What does the future hold? We do not know. But what I do know is that uh, what I just presented here in the general context, and indeed what could have, uh, what this operation could have uh, provide, uh, brought to the Renault group, uh, and indeed members of the group uh, were looking at this opportunity very positively indeed. And that issue 
to me, uh, well, that uh, that that uh, uh, opportunity to me was uh, and remains uh, most remarkable. Question number three. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jacques Vallin. Good evening, Ms. Sina, and good evening, everyone. I would like to address an issue that uh, uh, you, Mr. Sina, uh, 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 mentioned, the importance of the alliance and the uh, outlook for the alliance. It looks as though, uh, based on uh, well, looking at this uh, uh, cloak and dagger episode with Mr. Ghosn's arrest and uh, the more recent um, fiasco of the Chrysler, Chrysler Fiat uh, operation, it looks as though uh, Nissan and Renault do not see eye to eye regarding the alliance. At least that's what we can read between the lines. And so the question that I have is how do we believe, do you believe we can uh, arrive at a new modus vivendi uh, with Nissan on the alliance? Thank you, sir, and uh, thank you for the, the question. I did mention this uh, at the beginning of this meeting, and I would like to confirm here once again, but of course, uh, Thierry can say so as well. Um, the uh, alliance um, is uh, working uh, pragmatically and actively uh, in the field, the Renault teams and the Nissan, Nissan teams um, uh, have uh, benefited from the alliance. We've seen the results. Of course, we can always improve on operations. We can make the alliance more fluid. We can make uh, our work more efficient. But the work is right there. The alliance is uh, producing results, and uh, indeed, uh, the, the new developments and the upcoming developments are uh, all uh, alliance developments, and in particular, the alliance platforms. Now, there were discussions, and uh, uh, well, it, by the way, it shows that everybody has a viewpoint on that, but uh, uh, the alliance has been, uh, has, is, is, a, is a defining structuring uh, dimension of uh, this uh, group, and indeed, it is um, a, a unique uh, structure within the automotive industry. Indeed, uh, had it not been uh, for the alliance, I wouldn't be here today. Now, of course, there still will be debates and discussions with the alliance. Nothing is set in stone, and indeed, um, in uh, human institutions, I think nothing, uh, none of them is ever set in stone. Now, there could be direct exchanges, and it's just as well, because uh, there are different uh, cultures coming together, trying to work together. Uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> sometimes the, the debates are being, uh, as it were, relayed uh, by the media uh, uh, even before they happen. And I find this uh, most flabbergasting, and I find uh, that the media should uh, show uh, uh, more uh, restraint. And there was a recent development where uh, uh, there was a discussion of uh, uh, Renault's voting intention uh, at a uh, Nissan, at the Nissan AGM, where uh, we were seen to be uh, a warrior or at, uh, at odds or at war, indeed, with Nissan. Again, this is completely irresponsible. Uh, the alliance is there, but changes will happen especially after the uh, AGM that will take place at the end of June. And uh, I can only accept uh, this uh, development because it means that there will be more transparency, there will be um, a new uh, form of uh, ethics running the, uh, the alliance. And uh, basically, uh, this revolves around uh, the work of a number of uh, committees working under the board of directors, uh, uh, just like we have here at Renault. But of course, uh, these uh, committees arrive at uh, recommendations that uh, usually uh, then are taken up by the board. And uh, uh, in my capacity 
as a board member at NISA, and I voted in favor of that. But there's another issue. It may seem like a detail, but it just happens that this is a fundamental detail. It just so happens that a few hours before the uh, deadline for our voting intention uh, at this AGM, I learned indirectly that um, the uh, well, Nissan's intention was to uh, afford me the, the uh, opportunity to sit on one committee, but leave it at that. In other words, Thierry Bolloré, uh, who is the second representative, and there are not many of us, only two representatives out of 11, uh, was not um, slated to sit on any committee. Now, uh, that you might say that's not uh, very, that's not much of an issue. Uh, we have two, uh, well, we have two uh, Nissan representatives sitting on Renault committees, and I thought the least we could have is that two uh, Renault representatives sit on Nissan committees. Uh, we were not asking for more than that. In any case, uh, that's uh, not a big deal. At least that's not a, a Cassius uh, belly uh, or belli. Uh, but uh, I could not very well vote in favor of that change if governance, unless that very simple condition uh, be uh, respected from um, uh, from the um, from the start. And so. Uh, of course, uh, we can uh, uh, vote again on this uh, once we're told that we uh, uh, we can have two uh, uh, French board members uh, sit on the Nissan committee. Uh, th 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 there is not. Uh, this is not earth shaking. This will not uh, cause an eruption of uh, Fujiyama. So basically, we have uh, frank and direct exchanges. Uh, but it's just as well. It's just as well because at least um, we 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 think we say things uh, clearly and we can address them. Donc, uh, je... So now maybe I will go upstairs to number four. I'm sorry for the others. We'll get to you. Sign number four, please. But there's nobody there. Okay, well, if there's nobody for number four, maybe we can take three again, going back down and then back up again. Thank you. Yes, first of all, I wanted to say that personally, I'm delighted that you've become chairman of Renault. Then I had a comment and a question. You've just explained that a shareholder with 15% of Renault can block a fundamental project. And yet we have the impression that you, with 45% of Nissan's capital, are having difficulties. That was my comment. That's quite elegantly put, says the chairman. So then to echo the fiat matter, I think it was to be a marriage of equals. So could you give us examples of marriages of equals, especially in the automotive sector, that have worked? At any rate, I wouldn't want to, thank you, I wouldn't want for Renault to end up like Technip or Lafarge or even like SLO and to even go back in time uh, like Pechine without mentioning the competition with the Chinese. Well, thank you for this question. It was quite interesting and I'll tell you exactly what I think about it. For the first aspect, uh, we're having difficulties. Well, you know, as part of the agreements that we have between Renault and Nissan, uh, uh, well, we have the Rama. So, yes, we're having difficulties, but um, let me tell you that I'm not responsible for the agreements that were signed in 2015, which very significantly reduced Renault's influence over decisions made at uh, Nissan's board. I won't get into details, but to me, this is a situation that I think to be highly based on circumstances. I own it because I've inherited it, but I do not find it quite natural, to put things simply. I 
wasn't the chairman who led to this, so I won't be the chairman who will lead to a further reduction of Renault's role in the alliance, in particular uh, within uh, Nissan, because I think it would not be acceptable, and I think that you would probably write to hold it against me if you were to discover it someday. On this matter, I think that I've been very clear. Regarding the other aspect, and you're asking a quite valid question, in, uh, in the various criticism that you could hear about this now aborted project, uh, what you discussed was a fairly strong piece of criticism. Well, it so happens that I agree with you. Many so-called mergers of equals do not work out. Even uh, more or less equivalent attempts in the automotive world have not always been very successful or glorious. But let me tell you that what little experience I have in industry, I had to go through a few storms. You were very kind to mention the Pechine merger in which I was highly directly involved and I was not the only one. Our CFO then was one of my best uh, management controllers and um, I'm happy to have her here and uh, she knew it from the inside and so now I know what you need to do and what you need not to do, believe me. And the reason why I'm so vigilant about such operations is precisely because I know that they can lead to consequences which, if uncontrolled, can be highly detrimental. I won't conceal that because it's a reality. However, now let's rise up of this debate. I know that these operations can happen when cultural matters are easy to deal with. And in this case, I think that all conditions are met for this cultural bond to be created naturally. The work between the teams has been uh, done uh, very in depth, uh, uh, has proven it. Well, you may say that uh, you can never be 100% sure. I agree, but you can be very vigilant. You can have experience and you can bring things under control. You know that very often, these matters are all about people, men and women. So I wanted to say that I have a few certainties about this, and I am ready to defend them. In this proposal, which is no longer on the table as we speak, there was a, an actual possibility to make it successful, to make it a good counterexample to what you said. That's what I had to say about this. Let me also say that this was the first time, really, that there was a possibility to create a European-based group, a European champion, at a time when people keep complaining about the lack of existence of such champions. This would have been a perfect example for France, for Renault, but also for Europe to prove that we're able to do something together. It was worth it, really, uh, going to such lengths to make it work, because if such an operation cannot work out, one can be desperate about Europe. But you probably know that I'm a very strong defender of the emergence of European champions. The context that I described earlier, before I broached the subject, deserved such a shot. Well, now, number 10, please. Number 10. Oh, sorry, number one. Uh, nobody there, number nine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Denis Branche from Fitrust. Well, you know that for about 10 years, We've been asking a number of questions from Renault about its governance, and we'd like to congratulate the company for the changes that were brought under your leadership. We're delighted to have heard Mr. Lagayette, and we'd uh, never heard in years uh, speak during an AGM. However, I wanted to ask a question. Well, uh, we've already discussed it, but about the uh, director's responsibility. It so happens that there are still a number of directors on the board who were there throughout this uh, somewhat uh, turbulent uh, 
history of the last two years, especially when at the AGM Mr. Gon's uh, remuneration was rejected uh, and uh, it was uh, accepted immediately after that uh, without discussion by uh, the board. So for these somewhat older, longer serving directors who have been maintained, have you set a new code of conduct? Similarly, uh, we asked a written question about potential responsibility for ENY as auditors. They've been serving as auditors for a long time, and either they did not see or refused to see a number of things that were discussed, and which, by the way, led to uh, the initiation of certain legal proceedings. Thank you. Thank you for both questions. I'm going to answer them. I'll answer the first one, and then I'll let Philippe Lagayette take the second one. But uh, I have major things to say about the first one. First of all, I have one major principle in life, which is that of respect for people. In the specific case of a board of directors, very often decisions are collective. Consequently, it will not be my idea to pinpoint this or that person for individual responsibility for this or that matter. I still think that a board's responsibility is collective. That is number one. Number two, I believe, uh, based on my management experience in enterprises and that applies to all team management teams, including a board, it's very difficult to judge the performance on a, of a team if you free yourself of the way it is being led, if you get my drift. Consequently, as far as I'm concerned, I'll take responsibility for leading the board of directors of the group in the way that I think to be the right one. In this context, I said it earlier, I do intend to make people more accountable, as they should. Today, I have no specific reason, especially for the people who you've mentioned. Uh, I have no reason to think that they do not fundamentally comply with this code that you would like to see strengthened, because I think that deep within themselves, they have exactly the same feelings as I. So in this board of directors, I will take my responsibilities regarding this, but the current composition of the board and its changes, as you could notice, there are a few changes. This board of directors in the next few months and years will be specifically careful about these matters of ethics. I will see to it and I will take full responsibility if necessary, if such was not the case. I hope I have now answered your question. Now regarding the second one, regarding the statutory auditors, I was not there during that period. Maybe I can suggest that Philippe could answer. Sir. I haven't heard about any criticism regarding uh, the way the statutory auditors operated and worked for Renault. I think that they did their job as they should. Well, it's probably their role to explain, but personally, I cannot see what grounds we have to criticize them on that. Let me add that what we are doing, what the CARE committee is doing, or that what, which was approved by the board, is to apply the rules in terms of rotation between auditors. You may have seen that three or four years ago, one of the statutory auditors changed, and I will tell you that the care committee uh, has already launched a, a call for proposals to recruit a new auditor within a year. So we are quite aware of the fact that rules need to be applied when it comes to auditors, and that's what we are doing. So I think that the chief financial officer can confirm this fact. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, time flies and we've uh, answered a very important question, so maybe I will ask you to speed up and maybe we'll take two questions in succession so that we can 
answer them so that we can then move on to a vote on resolutions because there are many of those. So maybe I'll take questions four and seven. It's arbitrary, but that's how it is. Dominique Chauvin, I'm a forward-looking scientist. I asked a question at the Techno Center about plug-in hybrids. April statistics showed that in uh, the growth of electrified vehicles, this growth is slowed down by the decline of uh, PHEVs in this whole set. Isn't that the first sign that uh, uh, the uh, a strategy based on FEVs uh, goes against uh, major trends? And given Renault's historical vision based on EVs, which seems to have been somewhat uh, hijacked to come back to PHEVs, uh, which would be a sort of transitional measure. Uh, maybe it's time to skip the FEV step to accelerate on pure EVs in particular to respond to the Chinese tsunami that you mentioned. Thank you for your question. Thierry will answer. Thank you for your question. Your question contained part of the answer with what we need to do. First of all, the Renault Group strategy is electrical. Secondly, we've seen a change in the customer demand in the regulatory environment, which is accelerating in such proportion that, as you could see, there's been a decline in the share of diesel versus other types of energy. Third, background driver, although batteries have made significant progress year in, year out, although the recharging network is becoming established both inside and outside cities, but too slowly from our perspective, that's why we have a lot of projects with other stakeholders to accelerate that shift. And as you said, at a time when a transition with specific powertrains helps connect between the uh, specific needs uh, that were met by diesel engines in the past before batteries, he, battery EVs have sufficient batteries and range and sufficient charging points. Uh, between that, we need to bridge. That's exactly what you said. The aim for us is to make sure that hybridization that's offered on top of battery EVs and uh, simple IC engines will follow the strategy, the spirit of our strategy. That's the reason why I said earlier that our hybrid for Clio 5 offers a customer, a unique customer experience. Why? Because it almost runs as an EV, especially when you're in uh, urban or near urban environments, which is where it's most interesting to drive cleanly. And when you see our plug-in hybrid for the future capture, it will be even more mind-boggling. So it's not uh, your regular plug-in hybrid. We really want it to stand out so that we don't just reduce CO2 but offer a customer experience, which is indeed that offered by battery EVs. The aim is really to make that technology singular and unique in uh, on the market, but What's more, make it accessible to all of our customers. This is really aligned with uh, the uh, Renault DNA and strategy adapted to circumstances. Thank you, Thierry. Well, then maybe question seven, if you agree, because then we need to move to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. CEO. I have a question. It seems that Mr. Martin Vial represents the government. And he see Mr. John Elkin as a predator. If there was to be a merger, he that would be a, a welcoming a wolf in sheep's clothing, as it were. So could you reassure us that if there was to be a merger, then you would still be there? Well, if that can reassure you, well, I, I, all the more, all the better. Well, anyway, that that is highly notional or theoretical because once again, at this stage, the uh, merger talks have stopped. 
But let me answer yes. I will still be there. And it's not a habit for me to just sit there passively, to be friendly looking, uh, but uh, entirely mute. But once again, it's all very notional. But if I can reassure you retroactively, retrospectively, I have no worries about that. And anyway, when it comes to wolves, I've seen worst wolves in my existence. Well, I'm, po I'm positively sorry. We could have uh, gone on for hours. There are so many wonderful topics, but I will now ask you to move on to a vote on resolutions. Jean-Benoit, over to you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, we'll now move to a vote on resolutions. If you agree, I will only read the title of each resolution in the notice of meeting instead of a uh, comprehensive reading. First, please become aware of the voting procedure with your voting devices. Dear shareholders, your voting device, which was given you after signing of the attendance sheet is strictly personal, the number of votes that you own or represent is loaded into the device and displayed on s screen. You'll only need to use the green, yellow, or red buttons. R green for, vo for four, yellow for an extension, and red for against. After reading each of the resolutions, uh, a, a vote will immediately be started saying the vote is open. Then you'll see a progress bar on screen, giving you a countdown of the seconds that you have to vote. When the countdown is up, uh, the secretary will announce the vote is closed and it will no longer be possible to vote. Results will be displayed on screen a few moments after the vote is closed. Last comment, please switch off your mobile phones during the vote and please return the devices when you exit the room. We will now move to a vote. The total shares held by shareholders present or represented is 132 million. 39,031 uh, shares, 132,031,930 uh, shares, so 53.53% uh, of votes uh, for an extraordinary meeting. The quorum necessary for valid deliberation by the AGM, uh, both in, in ordinary and extraordinary sessions, is reached for the ordinary part. First resolution. Approval of the annual financial statements for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2018. The vote is open. The vote is closed. This resolution is adopted with 90.73% of votes. Resolution 2, approval of the consolidated financial statements for the financial year ended December 31st, 2018. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The resolution is approved with 90.65% of the votes. Third resolution, allocation of net profits for the financial year ended December 31st, 2018, setting of the dividend and the dividend payment date. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The resolution is approved with 99.75% of the vote. 
Fourth resolution. Statutory auditors report on the information used to determine the compensation for participatory shares. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The vote is closed. The resolution is adopted with 91.04% of votes. Resolution 5. Approval of the Statutory Auditor's Special Report on Related Party Agreements and Commitments governed by Articles L22538 at SEC of the French Commercial Code. The vote's open. Vote is closed. The resolution is approved with 88.33% of votes. Resolution 6, approval of a related party agreement governed by Article L22538 of the French Commercial Code, second amendment to the Master Corporation Agreement entered into between the company Nissan Motor Co. Limited, Daimler, Renault, Nissan, BV, and Mitsubishi Motors. The vote's open. The vote is closed. Approved with 90.66% of the votes. Resolution 7. Ratification of the co-opting of Mr. Kumar Kurb as director appointed upon proposal of the French state. Before we move on to a vote, let's watch a short profile of Mr. Kurb. I started my career at the Defense Ministry in aeronautics programs, and then I served in various positions at the Ministry of the Economy and Finance for international negotiations. I was uh, a chief of staff of ministers. I led change management, human resources, and uh, organizational transformation. More recently, I, had, uh, I was at the uh, Treasury Department and currently at the Big Corporations Department. Via the alliance with Nissan and Mitsubishi, Renault is a global automotive leader. It's also a player which has proven its uh, innovative ability, which uh, gave it a lead over competitors, especially for electric vehicles. This alliance created value for its members. And last but not least, Renault is an iconic company for France and its international reputation. The government can help Renault first by implementing policies in France that will enable Renault to work in, an, in a favorable economic environment to promote its development. And most specifically, in the automotive sector, the government has a, uh, an automotive competitiveness roadmap that was developed by Renault and other companies and with trade unions that will help implement transformative product, projects on connected and autonomous vehicles on competitiveness uh, actions that companies need in the field. And these measures will be made available to Renault to en enable it to grow in France and abroad. The vote is now open. The vote is closed. This resolution is adopted with 98.52% of the votes. Well, congratulations to Mr. Kurb. Eighth resolution ratification of the appointment of Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard as director. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The resolution is approved with 90.88% of the votes. Thank you so much for your trust. Thank you.
ninth resolution, appointment of Ms. Annette Finkler as director. Before we move to the vote, let's watch another short video profile of Ms. Winkler. I started my career after a technical apprenticeship and studying economics. I took over management of our family company in the construction business. After 11 years, Daimler offered me to join them as head of communications for Mercedes-Benz. In 2010, my greatest professional dream became true and Daimler gave me the full leadership of the smart car division. And uh, to continue the cooperation with uh, Renault for the development of new shared platforms and, of course, for a global sales where we could develop new markets, especially China. Personally, I think, of course, uh, the close cooperation that there has been between Renault and Mercedes teams for a new shared platform for Twingo and Smart. And that's why my perception of Renault is first and foremost based on great men and women, talented, skilled, who work with great enthusiasm for their companies. I would greatly like to use all my energy to share my experience with the Renault teams. The vote's now open. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 91.01% of the votes. Congratulations. Welcome, Annette Winkler. I could see that you have a great collection of miniature cars that uh, a lot of uh, young people would be jealous of. Resolution 10, approval of the components of the overall compensation and benefits of any kind paint or allocated to the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Carlos Gone for the financial year ended December 31st, 2018. Uh, let me remind you that the Board of Directors recommended against this resolution. Votes open. This resolution is rejected uh, by 11.29% of votes. Resolution 11, approval of the principles and criteria for determining, allocating, and awarding the components of the overall compensation and benefits of any kind attributable to Mr. Carlos Gone as chairman and CEO for the fiscal year 2019. The votes are open. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 89.71% of the votes. Resolution 12, approval of the principles and criteria for the determining, allocating, and awarding the components of the overall compensation and benefits of any kind attributable to Mr. Jean-Dominique Senat as chairman of the board of directors for the fiscal year 2019. The vote is open. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 91.01% of the votes. Resolution 13, approval of the principles and criteria for determining, 
allocating and awarding the components of the overall compensation and benefits of any kind attributable to Mr. Thierry Bolloré as Chief Executive Officer for the fiscal year 2019. The vote's open. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 87.85% of the vote. Resolution 14, approval of a related party commitment governed by Article L225421 of the French Commercial Code entered into by the company to the benefit of Mr. Thierry Bolloré, corresponding to a non-compete agreement. The vote's open. Vote. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with the 89.93% of the votes. Resolution 15, sorry, I'm getting carried away. Approval of a related party commitment governed by Article L225-42-1 of the French Commercial Code entered into by the company to the benefit of Mr. Thierry Bolloré for a top pension scheme. The vote's open. Vote. The vote is closed. The resolution is approved with 87.79% of the votes. Resolution 16, authorization granted to the Board of Directors to perform company share transactions. The vote's open. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 90.86% of the votes. Resolution 17 for the extraordinary part of the AGM. Authorization granted to the Board of Directors to reduce the company's share capital by cancelling Treasury shares. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The resolution is approved in 92.96% of the votes. Resolution 18, authorization granted to the Board of Directors to proceed with free allocations of existing or new company shares to employees and to corporate officers of the company and of companies of Group Renault waiving shareholders' prefer preferential subscription rights. The vote's open. The vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 88.14% of votes. 19th resolution, powers for formalities. The vote's open. Vote is the vote is closed. This resolution is approved with 91.20% of the votes. All of the resolutions on the agenda were subject to a vote. Thank you for your patience. And I will now give the floor to our chairman to close this meeting. Well, thank you so very much for your votes, which were very positive. It's very encouraging. On behalf of the board of directors of Thierry Bolloré, and the whole Renault team here and myself, I would like to thank you for attending this general meeting with your very relevant questions. Thank you. And now let's move on to um, the lobby for refreshments.